Wonderful. So, welcome to our workshop, G20 Compact with Africa, organized by UNIC, Intercultural Migration and Integration Center, based in Amber. My name is Beatrice Anoka'ola, and I'm moderating today together with my colleague, Farah Schlieger. And um, yeah, I welcome you all. We're very happy and honored that you're here. Um, Imic is founder of the Africa Day, a festival here in Hamburg, intercultural festival. And this year we also had a G20 panel. Um, even one of our panelists is here. This is um, Professor Dr. Rancio. It's very interesting. No, we had our panel. Um, today we want to have a discussion in the form of a fishbowl, so um, everyone is free to join the discussion. Um, we will show a small video and um, my colleague Faust, he was attending the conference last week in Berlin, so he will also give us an insight about the interview with Gunther Locke. And um, we will have on the panel Mr. Sukhoi, I hope I pronounced it right, Mr. Bukosi, Mrs. Nancy Alexander, and um, Mr. Falk is going to lead the discussion. So, yeah, we're going to have impressions about the protest against the 20 partnership conference. We're going to see it on the screen. And then um, the results of the G20 Africa Partnership Conference will be presented by Mr. Sun Kori and Mr. Bokosi and my colleague Park Schneider. So I hope we're all going to have a good time. And I will give you later on a small summary about our panel we had during the Africa Day. And of course, our founder of AMIC is around, Mrs. Gerlich. She's just sitting right here. And Mr. Heinrich, these are the two people behind Enric who are really the people here in Hamburg who are trying to support families um, who are not really yet well integrated, children who have problems in school, um, refugees who need support by paperwork, and Enric is the number one institution in Hamburg to get in touch with. Yeah, hello. Also, a uh, warm welcome for me, Falk Schlieger. Um, nice to meet you all. It's a very big pleasure to have you here in Hamburg. And um, just to make it very short for the beginning, we want to introduce uh, EMIC a little bit, and that's uh, also possible with the words of the former uh, Hamburg Senator of Economic Affairs and Employment at this year's Africa Day uh, Festival. Okay. 
came in the end of 50s, uh, early 60s. So you can say, for instance, most of them are the Ghanaians, and they are about um, fourth to fifth generation now in Hamburg. And I can say that in African uh, community, we are of less than 65,000, that's about one, uh, 3.5, uh, thousand of um, population of the Africans here in Hamburg, and therefore we are there to help each one that would like also need our help. Thank you. Three point five percent for African descent, uh, Hamburgers from African uh, descent, and Afro Germans, of course, also. And um, Yes, now we want to introduce more about the compact, the topic of the uh, of this workshop and EMAC for example also uh, try to um, transport the messages uh, from the official side, from the civil society side, from different uh, sides uh, of the G20 process also to Africa, to Africans uh, as well as uh, uh, as well as here in, in Hamburg, but also internationally to Africans uh, in their countries. And so it was uh, rather natural to uh, become part of the process uh, also concerning the compact with Africa. And um, as Beatrice said, I was last, uh, or this week actually, uh, the beginning of the week I was in Berlin at the Africa conference and I had the opportunity to uh, interview the um, yeah, personal rep representative of uh, Chancellor Merkel for Africa, the BMZ uh, Commissioner for Africa, Günther Nuke, and uh, I think it would be good also to hear from him what is the compact with Africa in a nutshell. And I will present to you, and I will write it also down on the whiteboard, then afterwards I will present to you the website which is created, which was launched on uh, Thursday, which is created by the International Monetary Fund um, to provide all the information as a one-stop shop uh, what's all about the compacts with Africa. Um, I will present you also <coughs> there. Mr. Günther Nuke, you are the personal representative of the German Chancellor for Africa, this is Angela Merkel and you are also the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development Commissioner for Africa. And you are here in Berlin at the G20 Africa Partnership Conference and uh, what kind of future potential do you see in Africa? The potential of the African countries on the African uh, continent is in, 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 in prosperity in the well-being of the entire society in those countries and that means it's a huge potential for economic growth. But now we have not really get a chance to use this potential by uh, businessmen in the African countries, SMEs, but also bigger investments and with foreign direct investments uh, we we can do much more and what we are speaking about at this conference is that the framework at the macroeconomic level, at the level of the business environment and uh, regarding um, financial instruments, that uh, some of those preconditions for economic development uh, has to become better. That means that uh, the countries can choose from different variety of modules prepared in the so-called Compact with Africa paper by international financial organizations, the World Bank Group, the International Monetary Fund and the African Development Bank. And they are able to commit themselves to those modules and that will lead to an easier financing by public financing and also by private financing. We have to push forward this infrastructure uh, investment and for instance a power plant is it's very easy uh, to finance in the, with the private sector by roads uh, for roads and railways it's more different and so we we are here to speak at this conference in detail 
very concrete about the, the best way and tailor-made solutions for the uh, up to now already seven compact countries. You have also described some of the problems. What are the most urgent problems to tackle in the you know, perspective? I think we need the political will of the leaders and the governments in African countries. We have to combat corruption and all kind of bad governance. We need for business, for especially for the German business, and we need much more accountability and predictability of uh, those investments. But we have to learn from each other. That also means uh, we cannot expect that the German companies will find the same conditions as in Europe or like in, in North America. We have to uh, guarantee some of the investments with investment guarantees or risk insurances so that the first step into a country which is kind of uncertainty for, uh, for the uh, businessman or for the company that uh, this could be shared by the public sector and the private sector. We do not want to guarantee 100% of investments, but maybe we have to do more also from the German government and regarding uh, public uh, uh, guarantees. There is, for instance, uh, at the level of the European Union, the external investment plan, where we want to guarantee 30% of the investments. These are the kind of best solution or best practices you want to urge to the African leaders? The compact countries create a kind of uh, new brand for good financial governance and it is about creating role models for others that, that they can follow and make this uh, uh, benchmarking uh, relatively successful investments in countries compared to others. We, we have seen, for instance, in the North African countries that uh, many of them have special economic zones. They created the zone, set up the rules of procedure, but nothing has happened. And close to the port in Tanga, Morocco created also a specific uh, economic zone. This zone was managed by the private sector for the private sector. The, the government has to give up power and not uh, to conduct everything. And this uh, so-called automotive city has created uh, 100,000 new workplaces with a lead investor from France, Renault, and uh, they are producing for the automotive industry. Uh, and that's one example how it can work. Yes, um, this was Peter Roker and um, also introducing the compact with Africa in nutshell, I would say. And I will write his uh, website. Um, it's not easy to find <laughs> um, yeah, on the whiteboard there. And now we want to present also from the Africa Day just as a sh short um, uh, impression of our discussion we made there also um, another
without doing good business, without repeating the old song of corruption, without repeating the old song of non-functional institutions. We can talk about this private-public partnership, but if the institutions are not there, if they are not functional, if they remain on paper, then it's, we are not moving forward. And I want to differ from my colleague here. It looks like 50 years down the road, since the bigger part of Africa got independence, we are still seeing the blame game. The white man did this for us. The white man did this for us. We are not involved. Why don't we say the white man is not doing it? Let's do it ourselves. Okay. Thank you. If they're not doing it, so let's do it ourselves. But if we continue singing this game and blaming, we did not come up with this fact. They came up with this fact. They decided to include us. And instead of saying, thank you, you included us, let's take it forward. What are we doing? Blaming them. They only want to take our things. If you're not making use of it and I'm your neighbor, I will make use of it. Okay? This is what I'm thinking. We should go back and ask ourselves, if we are going to invite a German company to come and do business in Ghana, and this is the policy or the constitution, whatever acts you're doing, are these things implemented the way they are? Must this company give a kickback to get things done? If I have to get a license, why should I take three months, chasing us like three years, simply because some bureaucrat is sitting there and is not doing the things the right way? These are the things that we, are, should, we should be talking about other than saying they only want to take our things. Even if, you're, if you have a neighbor who has mangoes around and I don't have mangoes and you're not making use of them, I will come for them. If I see that you're making use of them, then you do it. If you want to guard your mangoes, you guard them rightly. So the thing is, yes, you want to do business with us, but let's have equal terms, let's have a starting point, let's get our own house clean and stop playing the blame game every now and then. Thank you. Thank you. Two things of which I'll pick up. I'll come to the microphone. Is that time for questions? One second, one second. We'll take the question like that. Don't worry. Yes, yeah, give your question. Give your question. One second. Yeah, um, like yeah. uh, after working for 30 years in this field, uh, I think I know very much what goes on in the world. I've been all over the world giving talks on these uh, issues. And one thing I will say that we cannot have our analysis just on the surface. There are two things driving what we are observing in Africa. We can look at systemic dynamics. You can call it a blame game or whatever you call it, it is there. How the international systems affects all African countries. That is systemic dynamics. The other is structural paralysis, where the African structures are also paralyzed. So you're looking at two points, you cannot look at one side, and you have to examine and re-examine, interrogate and re-interrogate both areas in order to have a good solution. Okay, so both sides are real. Honestly, both sides are real. And when Nkrumah said the independence of Ghana is meaningless unless it is linked with the total liberation of countries in Africa, it is about liberation of the economy. It is about liberation of the people. It is about liberation of the mind. And we have not done that sufficiently. And it's about time we wake up and get involved with what we have to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so these were just two uh, standpoints or two points um, out of the discussion. Um, and now I just want to introduce uh, very, very shortly and briefly the uh, G20 Partnership Conference. Um, and two days ahead of the G20 Partnership Conference, approximately 1,000 uh, protesters took part in a demonstration at uh, the center of Germany's capital, Berlin, under the slogan for global freedom of movement and self-determined development, they spoke out against the building of borders in Africa due to European migration control policy. Arms, business corporations from the G20 states and the ruling development policy aggravates the misery in African countries, they said. I just want to draw the whole picture of uh, what was going on here in um, uh, the in Berlin, and, and it's 
not necessarily my opinion or so. Um, and this is a blockade. Uh, it's the second day of the G20 partnership conference. Approximately 50 people from the same protest alliance tried to block the map. The main entrance of the venue they had have been detained uh, shortly after by German police. And uh, now it's uh, time to present the results of the G20 Africa Partnership Conference. And first, uh, I prepared also, first I want to uh, ask Mr. Um, Tsongkeo also uh, from the African Development Interchange Network as our key panelist, um, what he has attending the partnership conference there, what he has drawn out as a result of uh, the partnership conference. Thank you, thank you very much. After all what we heard, I don't know how much my opinion will count here, but I come out of the conference with a lot of questions. That is, questions about understanding the real substance of the compact. Because uh, that's, and, and those questions don't just come from me as an individual. These are the questions that uh, many African citizens ask themselves, that is, what is really in the compact? I'm not sure I do understand the compact better than before the conference. So, and, uh, and I think uh, that's where we, we, we need to do some homework as civil society and also as governments from Africa. That is, we really need to understand what the substance of the compact is. We hear that it's about uh, facilitating private investment in Africa. Uh, this is not the first time we hear this. We've been hearing this for like 50 years, someone said it in what you were presenting. Now, what is new in the compact? And this is the question we should be asking ourselves. So out of the conference, I'm still asking myself that question. That is, what is really new in the compact? And very, more importantly, the question I'm asking myself is, what is good in the compact? I don't just want to reject it, but I want to understand it and see how we can shape something beneficial for our people in Africa from the compact. And this is where a, another conversation should start. For me, the conference, we should consider the conference as the beginning of a new conversation. A new conversation on the way we, we, we are shaping the future of Africa. And to do this, you can't do this without looking at what the African expectations are. And where do you see this? You see this in the African vision 2063. And a, a, a very important thing here is that Africa now has a strategy for its development. So whatever you want to do, you need to look at that and look at it very deeply, not just as uh, uh, Carlos Lopez rightly said a few weeks ago about the compact. He said the compact is referring to Agenda 2063 just in terms of, of cross-referencing. That is, just mentioning the agenda for it to look good. No, we should go beyond just men mentioning the pillars of the agenda. We should make sure that anything that will be done tomorrow with the compact will really go in the sense of serving the African agenda. So that, that's, 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 my, that's my point here. So I'm, I still have a big, big, big question mark here. What is it that we can do with the compact? For it, for it to be useful for Africa. Thank you. And um, just to uh, mention what was the outcome uh, also of the um, different countries, one has to distinguish between the so-called compact with Africa countries. It's yeah, the procedure, an, uh, an official application procedure for a country to participate in a compact. Basically, it's uh, open to all African countries. Interested countries take part in a so-called structured dialogue with local representatives of international financial institutions, International Monetary Fund, World Bank Group, uh, African uh, Development Bank, um, to examine whether the compact initiative is suitable for their country. If they are interested, the country's finance ministers write to the respective G20 presidency. The G20 presidency then afterwards invites the African finance ministers 
to uh, G20 meetings, and um, so if they agree, of course, and afterwards, compact investment partnerships are negotiated between the African country, the international financial institutions, and other partners, e.g. individual G20 countries. Um, for example, Germany has uh, made uh, a special re uh, agreement with three of that seven proposed uh, countries, and it's uh, uh, Ghana and um, <laughs> and Tunisia. And um, I just want to present you the so-called prospects at the partnership conference. There were investment roundtables, also uh, under the so-called Chatham House rule. Somehow, sometimes that there is not allowed uh, anything to go come out of uh, um, to the public, and um, so it was very specific. Uh, on different investment areas, and for example, Morocco is one of the major countries uh, receiving something, and uh, I would just want to introduce you a little bit what's in that specific uh, compact, and it's about the so-called automotive industry, what you already heard from uh, Mr. Noga, and uh, it's also about um, aeronautics, the countries can have their own perspective in what kind, uh, in what area particularly they want to draw attention. And uh, it's also textiles, renewable energy, and infrastructure and logistics. And just to mention another country, Ghana, for example, um, they just have made a memorandum of understanding up to now, so it's in the process uh, of negotiating. Uh, the compact uh, in detail, and uh, Ghana uh, has said the finance minister um, also in an interview and at the conference that uh, they want to draw attention to energy, also renewable energy in the agriculture and agribusiness, and uh, they have a big, uh, in Accra, in the capital of Ghana, they have a big aluminium um, yeah, factory, and they want to have investments on that also, and they want to improve the financial system, uh, yeah, of course, all the financial system. Just to have you presented uh, some short uh, examples, and you can find everything in detail for the specific countries in the uh, website from the IMF I mentioned. Right, and now um, I want to ask Mrs. Nancy Alexander, um, who is the um, who is the, from the Heinrich Boll Foundation North America and uh, the Director of Economic Governance Program. Also, if she wants to add uh, right now a little bit to that, and um, she has also prepared a short presentation. Sometimes when we have discussions like this, it doesn't fully capture what's gone before. The G20 has been working on um, Africa and especially infrastructure for seven years. And so there's a lot of water under the bridge. And I wanted to show you that um, while Africa has made clear the kinds of goals that it's pursuing, um, the draw of minerals and mining is very strong. Um, there's a, the compact makes extractive industries very, very prominent. And the program for infrastructure development in Africa is something that G20 has been working on for many years in four sectors, transport corridors, energy, uh, water, and ICT. So you'll see especially energy and transport corridor is very prominent. And it's because they've been working on it. This um, is a map of um, P PETA's energy uh, projects, uh, transportation projects. Uh, the World Economic Forum and the World Bank got very frustrated because investors weren't coming into Africa, so they asked the presidents of each country to come up with the project that they would champion. And geostrategic considerations feature very prominently here. 
for instance, Nigeria to Algeria pipeline, did President Buhari in Nigeria really listen to people and say that's the number one thing they wanted was to get gas to Europe? Similarly, on the east coast of Africa, did the president of Kenya discuss with people and come up with a railroad that would cost 6% of gross domestic product in Kenya? Or the coal mine that's part of the Lamu Port South Sudan project? So I just want to leave you with the impression that it's very important in looking at the compact with Africa to know that in particular, transport and energy and mining efforts to bring finance to Africa supposedly have been underway for a long time. And I wanted just to raise a few points for your consideration. The first thing is that the G20 is utterly policy incoherent. Trade and investment and economic policies are over here. Sustainable development and climate are over here. Last year at the China G20 summit, all the leaders said that they were in favor of all forms of energy, especially natural gas, especially natural gas. And we're talking about locking in technology for generations. And the social side of projects is not systemically considered either. So we desperately need the G20 to have coherent policies. The second point is that the compact is full of myths. They try to give the impression that public-private partnerships are going to bring lots of money to Africa. And the World Bank did an evaluation two years ago, 128 World Bank finance PPPs. Their conclusion was that there was no, as in zero, additionality by the private sector. Absolutely none. Now, if you look over a broad range of continents and a broad range of experiences, you'll find that the private sector can bring 20 to 30 percent of project costs. Is this working? So this is really a misrepresentation, in my view, that this is not discussed more. The third point is that the compact brings huge biases. And I want to name them. Number one, big is better. Cross-border is better. Energy and transport are better. What are the plans for urbanization? Do you know how Africa will urbanize? It doesn't seem to fit anywhere in the compact plans. So bigger is better. Energy, it doesn't matter what the source is. That's another bias. It doesn't matter. Yeah, we'll throw some renewable in. Number three, that PPPs are necessarily better, and they don't usually compare PPPs with the public works alternative. Monitoring and evaluation of PPPs has been so bad that in the health sector, the World Bank says it faces reputational risks because health sector is becoming unaffordable for people. So there's no outcomes that are systematically studied. So the third point is the bias. The fourth point is something very, very dear to my heart, and I'm winding up here. And that is that in order to do a compact, the World Bank, African Bank, and IMF have decided that they need to standardize all projects, roll them out in three years instead of seven years. So I have a team of lawyers working with me that have identified eight problems for the standard contract, which the G20 plans to roll out all over Africa in 2017 and 18. I'll say 
three things about this standardized contra contract. Number one, it puts an insane amount of risk on the public sector. Number two, it doesn't really encourage uh, transparency, and it, or it does so only modestly. And number three, it risks impeding the state's right to regulate in the public interest more than these famous investment agreements that you've heard about, like the draft TTIP and TPP. The contract has all these investment clauses in it calling for international dispute resolution and calling for all these benefits to the private investor, and it violates the norms of international law in terms of how much risk it puts on the public sector. And that just means that these projects could be a debt bomb waiting to happen. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Ms. <laughs> Alexander. Um, also, uh, I want to invite you all to be a part of the discussion here inside the um, circle. <laughs> Sorry, uh, we are, have a big circle and the inner circle. This is a fishbowl thing, and um, everybody is warmly, uh, hardly welcome um, to be part and uh, contribute. And Mr. Tonkeo, maybe you could also introduce more about your consultation paper, the content of your consultation paper you have made with uh, at least. Um, in 40 countries, African countries, at least with 60 um, in, uh, NGOs, um, what they are saying, what do the African NGOs say? Thank you. I'm smiling here because if I was giving you the raw material that came from the, <laughs> that came from the consultation, you will hear a lot of things. You will hear things like, it is a conspiration against Africa. Uh, I just picked one. From all what we so, so just to summarize how much difference you, you, you can have in the views that came from the consultation. But the good thing is that we, we managed to, to have that consultation. We consulted uh, with uh, a number of African civil society coming from all the five regions of uh, sub regions of Africa. And what comes out of this is as the paper says. A lot of caution. That is, Africans are, mm -hmm. they may welcome the, the compact, but they are cautious, as I said earlier, they are cautious about the real content and the real perspectives and what Africa can really expect from this. They are particularly cautious about the way this initiative, which we say is new is going to be different from all what they saw before. So many Africans are asking, how is this going to be different from what we've already seen? And the idea of a conspiracy comes to be supported by the fact that, and you, you heard it from what Nancy just presented, that we, we, we again see behind all of this, we see the World Bank, we see IMF, we see international financial institutions. African people are very, they, they have a very, I mean, the, the history of those institutions that intervening in Africa is not a really good one. It's a sad one in some, in some places. When we, we, we remember the, 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 the structural adjustment plans, it was very, very painful for many Africans. There are countries where you, you got to a situation where public servants saw their salary cut to the third, and even more. And uh, 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 social services really suffered from this. And out of the social adjustment, we never saw poverty step back. So this is this is not a good souvenir. And when we hear that the, the IMF and the World Bank are behind the compact, you understand how much Afghan citizens can be. We say cautious just to for you to hear things that are nice. So what comes from the results is really that bad. But there is still some hope. 
because some of those who were consulted still want to see from the compact something that could be good for their people. And they are hoping that they, they, they can work with their leaders, with their governments, to be in a better negotiating position because they think this is about international cooperation. That is engagement of African governments with the G20. Now, the idea for, for the civil society is that they need to work on a better way of negotiating with these people. And I think that's the most important thing in the result, that is looking at it as something which in perspective could be made good. But I'm going to deliver to you what the results were. The consultation was on five, five key questions. That is, we wanted to find out what the general opinion of Africans is about the, the, the compact. Also, we wanted to, to find from the, the, those who participated if the compact was something useful. The third thing was, what is the, what, what is the, the impact of uh, that initiative? on human rights and other issues that we, important issues that we have in Africa. Then we wanted to know how much the people were aware of not just the, com the compact, but of the G20 engagement by African governments. Then the, the last question was about uh, the missing, what is missing in the compact? So from the, those five questions, we got five, we got six, six key outcomes, that is summarizing the priorities and the expectations. Number one was that whatever is coming behind the compact, African citizens want the initiative to make sure that the investments that are coming are aligned with the African agenda 2063. That was the number one. Number two, is about rationalizing. Rationalizing anything that has to do with the new perception, that is the private sector coming in, with ODA, because they think that public resources still need to be handled somehow, and there need to be a good combination between those two, that is, between public investment and private investment to go in the direction that satisfies the African people. So that's what's number two. Number three is the involvement of Africans, I mean African citizens, in the conversation about the, the compact. So they, 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 they think that it is necessary for African citizens to be part of this. And they want to believe that the compact is not something which is already tight and which is not open to adjustment. So they, they want that African citizens should be part of that conversation. Number four is about the mechanisms. The mechanisms that are going to be used in the compact, they want the mechanisms to be clear, to be transparent, and not to be the kind of mechanism that will bring new problems or that will add to, to problems that we have had before, like the debt problem, the debt issue. So they say they want to see good mechanisms in, in the compact. And, uh, uh, number four was about harmonization of all initiatives because the compact, the, the, this new initiative comes after many other initiatives. And there are initiatives that exist, like initiatives between Africa and China, Africa and Japan, Africa and this. They want some kind of harmonization to make sure that those initiatives really are directed toward the real expectations of the people. Still again, they mentioned the Agenda 2063 here. And then number six is about transparency and accountability. So African citizens want to see in the compact some kind of tool that would allow them to be part of an, a monitoring and accountability framework. And those are the six key results that we had from the consultation. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Yes, very good. So I would also like to talk to Mr. Uh, before Okozi to give you your point of view 
about the contact with Africa. The advantage of speaking last is uh, you can simply say all I wanted to say has been said, so let's close the meeting. Unfortunately, I'm not going to do that in case uh, people who paid for my trip coming here, they will think they didn't do their job. Um, but on a more serious note, let us uh, look at the compact from a very broader view. And I come from an organization that actually focuses on date uh, and development. And I'll pick on from what Nancy said about big is better, uh, PPP is uh, better, and the silence around what are the implications on the compact countries in terms of their debt management, in terms of the liabilities that they will get in the process. But those of us who are old enough, and I think a lot of us here are old enough, um, we will remember what uh, Martin talked about, the structural adjustment programs. At that time, it was like, if you want help, if you want any aid, these are the policy things you should change before we can even talk to you. If you read the paper that the IMF, the World Bank, and unfortunately, the African Development Bank, uh, supposed to be the premier bank for Africa, uh, but, but in reality, you know, let me not say that part. Um, if you read that, it is actually structural adjustment programs through the back door. Because what they are saying, which the German government will not tell you, they will say there is a compact between us and the countries. But they will say, before you apply, you have to go to the IMF and the World Bank and agree. So the German government is out, the G20 is out, so the IMF will go and agree. But if you go to what the agreement is, there are three areas of policy changes. Very big ones. Macroeconomic change, which is macroeconomic stability, business environment, and then what they call uh, what uh, investor protection and financing. yeah financing. So it's business financing and macroeconomic investment. I'll give you an example. So basically, what they are saying is you need to change your regulations so that they protect the investor. Nothing about protecting the, the, the citizens, nothing about the impact on development, nothing about on SDGs, because as we have said, they have already concluded that PPPs will deal with it, you know, sustainable development goals, so we can't even question the link. The link is as established as it is. So when they talk about that, they're actually saying that you should, for example, one of the things that they're saying is that you should, you know, link, okay, protect the investors' political risk so that if something happens, if you decide to, to get another president, they cannot change the rules or the regulations they agreed with the previous investor. Even if that president might have lost because of exactly doing what is done. So democracy is being stifled there. The other condition that is very important that I have seen, and I talked about the other day, is we should allow free movement of capital. And when investors come and what they're telling you is about free movement of capital, it simply means that they want to take away everything. Now, basic mathematics or basic business tells you that unless you are like my grandfather who was a good businessman, you only put into a company or a country more than what you're going to get out. But an intelligent business person knows that if they put 200 into a country, they should get out with more than 200. And if you allow the person to take out the whole amount that he's made, what is going to happen is he will put in 200, he will take out the 200 plus everything else that he's made, and he will leave nothing in that country. And I think that's where we should be very careful. The other thing is about investor protection and dispute resolution. It is simply saying we don't trust you guys. So if there's going to be any dispute between you and the investor, your courts are completely useless to us. Don't even go to your courts, they are not necessary. We will have, this will have to be done outside your country. At most from the investor's country or some international, uh, and we know what international means, international sometimes means the G20 and the EU, irrespective of the fact that the EU and the G20 have double counting, because the same countries in the EU are the same countries in the G20, most of them. But I think it's important we realize that. Now, when it comes to 
the general overall conclusion. I start from asking myself, does Africa need additional resources in order to meet the sustainable development goals? The answer is always yes. Can we meet all our sustainable development goals through our domestic resources? Even if we improved, now they are low, even if we improve them, the answer is no. Can we meet all our sustainable development goals by relying on aid alone? The answer is no. Do we need the involvement of the private sector in meeting sustainable development goals? The answer is yes. Do we need infrastructure on the continent? Because a lot of these are infrastructure. The answer is yes. Can we do that infrastructure alone without assistance? The answer is no. So you see that if you answer those questions, that's why people say, no, but this is supposed to be for development. Because those answers are actually, as he said, are cross-referencing. So the thing we should be asking now is, what type of private involvement will meet the sustainable development goals? What type of infrastructure do we need? If you look at a lot of these, this is what I said about PIDA. I mean, I am, I am one of those guys who think Africa needs investment in infrastructure. I've looked at the program for infrastructure development in Africa. One of the big problems with the, the map that Nancy showed for some of us is that if you look at that, all the big infrastructure projects are not inside Africa. They actually, if, you, if she brought them up again, then you see that all the railways and everything are actually outside Africa. Why? The infrastructure that is being proposed is to facilitate exporting raw materials and not increasing industrialization within. And so the question of infrastructure we should be asking is what type of infrastructure? What type of PPP is doing it? What risks can we take as a country? And what risks should the private sector also bear? And what are the implications of debt? Because as we know, Mozambique is a good example where you know a lot of these PPPs will require the private sector to put in money. Um, and in reality, their money will get out because they will have made a profit if things go well. If things go bad, all that risk will be transferred to the citizens of that particular country. And that's what happened to Mozambique that, it, you know, there were a lot of contingent liabilities because these pro projects will be done by either by uh, government itself or state-owned enterprises or private sector within the country who need some guarantee because on their own, some of these partners cannot go and borrow on the international market. In order to get the legitimacy for the project to go, they will have to be guaranteed by the government. And when all these things go, what is going to happen is that things will actually go back to the government and as you and me know, those people in government know that 10 years down the line, they will not be there. And that risk will be transferred to the very, very marginalized poor person who will live to pay those debts for the rest of it. So finally, what I say is that, yes, we need infrastructure, but is this the right way to do that? And that's what we should debate. Do we really need to change our rules in mining, in infrastructure, just to attract a few investors? for only one part of the project, which is infrastructure, I don't think so. If you look at the compact countries, you know, some of them, they have got their brochures. If you look at the amount of projects that the compact is saying, and you look at the amount of regulation and the impact, they are not, they are not you know, it's like you are, you are opening your house to everything else just in order to get one small thing. And it's high time we actually interrogated this and say, okay, fine, what do we do? Going forward, we then need to interrogate with the compact because it's not clear and see what it is missing. And the big job for me is between us, when I mean us, I mean all of us who work with our governments in Africa to go back and get this debate going among the citizens. Let's interrogate, let's hold our leaders accountable. Do they know, do they understand what they're signing up to in terms of the impact on the citizens that they represent? So why will we ask you guys to help us we think the job begins now when we go back home in those countries that have signed the compact and those that are about to sign the compact to actually say, have we done an analysis and interrogated whether this is what the Germans are saying it is or this is the PR machine of saying this is what it is but they know what it will be. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Yeah, this was a very good insight. I mean, for me, I'm, I'm 
from Uganda, but I live in Germany, and um, so I grew up here. So, and I was also thinking and questioning myself, what is this conflict with Africa about? And I was also wondering for us who are here in the diaspora, what can we do? I mean, how can we also link up with institutions who are based in Africa to, to bring also awareness? Because I know also some of my friends over here, they also are not aware what this means. And um, I think um, we really need to find a way to to get closer with the diaspora, to find ways how we can get stronger to to, to bring much more awareness to, to this. Yeah. Can I make a proposal? And um, of course, you know, I would want to hear what my African friends think of it, but um, when, when this big team of lawyers delivered their verdict, uh, the public-private partnership contract that would be used in every single African country and said this violates really basic principles of international law, doesn't, doesn't depend on local courts, puts all the risk the, on the, the public sector, paralyzes the right to regulate. You know, one thing I would be doing, I think if I were you, is thinking about things like a moratorium. Kind of like the there has been a consultation on the projects, you know, on there has not been appropriate consultation on project selection. There has not been appropriate consultation on the project preparation and acceleration and replication process. There has not been enough consultation on the contract. And finally, there has not been enough consultation on what the African Continental Business Network is doing, which wants Northern pension funds, you know, to buy into all of Africa's infrastructure so that, you know, low income, medium income Africans can pay old people's pensions in Europe and the United States. I mean, if that happened, it would be the worst human rights violation I could really think of. So I'd just like to throw out the idea of a moratorium on the compact. So um, you also can answer to that question or uh, just keep in mind. And uh, I'm very delighted that you uh, have uh, taken the chance and everybody is <laughs> um, hopefully coming soon as well. Um, please introduce yourself and what you uh, want to contribute. Thank you very much indeed. My name is Davis Okom, and I come from Kenya in, uh, in East Africa. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I would want to uh, recognize the fact that uh, Africa needs trade. That is not in dispute. We really want to engage with the G20 and the rest of the world in, uh, in promoting trade. Uh, having said that, uh, I, I wish to uh, remind everyone that the founding fathers of, of Africa, people like Kwame Nkrumah, uh, President Kenyatta of Kenya, people like President Julius Nyerere, and, and so on, uh, had the great desire for Africa to be united and to speak together with, with one voice. And as a result of that, we have had a lot of uh, uh, regional blogs, like in East Africa, we have the East African community. In West Africa, we have ECOWAS. And in South Africa, we have the South Africa uh, uh, community coming together, which have structures to negotiate on trade and, and international issues. Now, looking at the compact with Africa, I was surprised to, to, to see that one of the preconditions for support is that individual African country must make an application, yet we have structures, we have regional blocks that are strong, that can speak with one voice. Why do you want to restrict us? Why can't you allow us to speak with one voice as a region, as East Africa or West Africa? Because we believe we have an African saying that uh, there is power in unity. We cannot be bulldozed when we are together we cannot be shortchanged when we speak together with one voice. So my message to this compact with Africa, let us negotiate as a block. Do not put a condition that only Kenya can negotiate and so on. We have had this uh, precedent set. We, we had the EU uh, trade agreements that the East African uh, countries had to negotiate and so forth. Why, why are you just 
restricting us to, to, to this. Now, my second point, we talked about uh, uh, these champions, uh, uh, one of our distinguished panelists talk of presidential champions, and I saw my president, Kenyatta of Kenya being mentioned as one of the champions because of the infrastructural developments. But we have a problem here because remember the, the, the Lapset and, and the more recently the SGR, the, the, the standard gauge uh, railway from Mombasa uh, traveling to Nairobi and, and so on was, was part of private investment from China. Uh, some Chinese got loan wherever they got it built that railways running into billions and, and billions of Kenya shillings, and uh, the, the cost was uh, uh, was uh, inflated. If you compare what we, we used, is not really what uh, SGR should, 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 should cost. Now, the question is this. When we allow such private investments to, uh, to go on with uh, billions and billions of, of shillings be, being uh, uh, are taken as loan and then the people have to pay back. What what is the, the, the benefit uh, when all is said and, uh, and, and, and done? Last but not the, the least, in Africa we want to have trade with, 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 with the G20 and the rest of the world. We want the market in the West to be open. We, we have uh, flowers. One day I saw flowers from Kenya and Sudan. We want to bring more flowers from Kenya, but you are putting a lot of restrictions in the EU with the standards and, and, and all this stuff that are not negotiated. But the compact only seems to say that, uh, okay, we protect investors from Europe and G20 and blah, blah, and not. We want also traders from Africa. I also want to become a trader. We want free space in G20. Thank you. Thank you, my name is Ryan Hapkai, I'm, I'm from Bread for the World. Um, I want to think with you about, I mean, strategically, how should we engage with tomorrow with, for example, the German government, we will have a representative of the Minister of Finance there. How should we engage about the compact with Africa? And I think this depends what, what kind of scenario we, we would envision, what, what will come out of the compact with Africa. I mean, we might have a, a bad scenario where out of the compact, we, an African country supported by the World Bank and, 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 and a, a, a G7 country uh, would engage a foreign investor making a murky PPP deal, publicly guaranteed, the deal will fall, the, the debt is there, nothing comes out, and, and it was a bad deal, maybe the, the environment was exploited, and so on and so forth. Um, we could have a positive scenario where we would say, oh, we will see um, interesting investments where perhaps uh, local financial markets are developed, publicly guaranteed by the MIGA or, or, or Western development banks, where we would see kind of productive investments, interregional trade, FOSA, and so on and so forth. So a positive scenario where in the end SDGs will be supported by, by private investment might it be an infrastructure or might be somewhere else. But for me, the most plausible um, scenario would be that actually after the German presidency and, and the German elections are over, the finance ministry will discover how oh, we do not have really the capacity to bring this forward, the Argentinian presidency is not really interested in it, and it will be just another G20 uh, initiative which is leading to nothing. And so I wouldn't actually very much worried about the moratorium on the compact. The moratorium is anyhow by far the most likely scenario what I would see. And um, what, what, we, what we, you presented uh, in, in, the, in the session before is that anyhow we had a kind of a moratorium on PPPs in low income countries in Africa. There are no PPPs in low income countries in Africa. It's not happening. We do not see investment in infrastructure in most African countries. And the question is then for tomorrow, what actually do we want to get out of the meeting? Do we want to get out the most likely scenario, which is a moratorium, which is nothing will happen, or we will pressure the ministry to say, we want to get something out, we want to get the positive scenario out, we want to get investment in, 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 in ways where SDGs are fostered and interregional investment and trade is, is fostered. And I think the possibilities are in, in the compact. 
It's not the most likely scenario, but it's possible. And this is what I would advocate for tomorrow. I mean, try to hold the finance ministry accountable and ask, do you have anything in the pocket which will make sure this most likely scenario that the whole initiative was just a, 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 a pre-election campaign for Germany will happen? I don't know if you have introduced yourself. Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Palm. And uh, now we go on to you. Okay, thank you very much. I'm Hansi Marinai from Mauritius, small island, right? And uh, I work for an NGO, which is the Pesticide Action Network. But I'm also representing the network of small island developing states. So, I've got a concern. It's, a, it's also a, 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 a question to, to our panelists, right? And uh, we have noted that because of the fact that in certain countries you have got well established democratic principles being observed, you have got elections coming every five years, like in, ours, in, in Mauritius and other countries as well. And because politicians become very, very unpopular after two or three years that they are coming to power, we have noted a new emerging scenario taking place. And that's money making. Right? What is, how does it, how is it that they do it? The governments, they don't like small projects. If there is a project likely to help the, the country, and if it is cheap, government is not interested. Right? If there is a cheap solution, it's not that what they like. They like very expensive. They like very projects where it, projects that involve huge sums of money. Now, but when you ask yourselves a question that why, why is it that such things are happening? We are a poor country, we are an African country. But let's go for cheap solutions where you can get easy employment for your people. But no. Then it comes to, to when you when you the more you ask questions, then you start finding solutions. It's because of accountability. These people, all our 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 leaders, political leaders, all the policy makers are not accountable. Once they are no longer in power they go, right, you can't touch them. So for them, it is in their interest to take the biggest project possible, the most expensive, because we know that part of the money goes elsewhere. I'm not saying 100%, but part of the money goes elsewhere, maybe in Deutsche Bank, right, but the most, the most popular is goes, it goes into Swiss Bank, right? And then once they leave, and they know that they are going to leave after five years. So they have made the money. So I don't know what kind of possibilities will there be between uh, G20 and Africa to make our leaders, our policy makers, our politicians who contract debt on a result, right? I know our friend from Aphrodite is very, very likes, he very much likes this question of uh, onerous debt, right? So unless people from G20, they come up with certain conditions that if it is not a sustainable project, you can be sued wherever you are, right? In Mauritius, we have got, for example, right now, people who are dealt, who are dealing with drugs, all their, all their properties, the properties of their close relatives, all are taken away, right? So this kind of situation should also be applied to politicians. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for allowing me to join the beauty contest. That's, that's how it feels, at least. <laughs> My name is uh, Jechitano, I'm from Ghana. I work with uh, an NGO called Third World Network Africa, and uh, I'm part of the Africa Trade Network. I think I agree with the Reinhardt that uh, 
our colleague from Bedford World who was sitting there, that uh, it's important to seek what kind of positive demands and positions that you ought to put forward. At the same time, I think that Reinhard might agree with me that a positive scenario depends, is predicated on having a strong critique against the most pernicious and dangerous aspects of what's on the table. And my three predecessors have actually elaborated quite a bit on that. And I think that just to emphasize one or two things and then to see whether we can come towards this positive uh, position. When um, um, uh, uh, Panwell talks about the, the IMF preconditions, which is part of the macro stabilization agenda, it's a really serious thing that we're talking about. In 2015, the IMF began to push for what they call a hard policy reset in Africa. The reason why it did that is that the so-called boom in Africa, which was based on global raw material prices going up, including perhaps your flowers, right, had crashed. African countries lost, in terms of GDP per year, almost 50% within two years, up to the end of 2016. Now, oil is only, the collapse of oil is only the most dramatic expression of a you know, pretty broad uh, 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 trend. So when you talk in terms of policy reset, one of the preconditions is a cut in public expenditure. So we are really talking about mobilizing public money to join in a private investment plan whilst you are actually cutting public expenditure. That's one dimension of it. Number two is that domestic prices should not rise that will eat into the potential profits of foreigners. So one of the things that is quite explicit in the compact framework document is to say that there ought to be, the governments ought to allow full currency adjustment. That's hard and fast full currency adjustment. In other words, devalue to the bone whenever your balance of payment or whatever it is. is. At the same time, it guarantees that any foreign exchange losses because of variation in exchange rates to the foreign investor will be compensated by the government. Now, clearly, there is no way on earth, if this is the scenario, you are going to begin to have anything proactive to say unless you stop that in the bud first and foremost. The only thing that you're going to be able to say in terms of currency policy, exchange rate policy, and so on, is to say something alternative, which perhaps is to say you want an African monetary fund, not your Africa development bank, which is, which is based on the fact that we are managing our exchange rate policies and our payment systems and so on and so forth in tandem, and that strong countries can support weak, weak countries, vice versa, and we have more autonomy in terms of our capital. You know, unless you have those things. Another dimension is that I think that the most innovative thing about the Compact for Africa framework so far is in the financial regime. I think Manuel was right to point that out. The financial regime is predicated, and Reinhardt talked in terms of domestic uh, uh, financial markets. I will beg to differ, or rather, you know, recommend some degree of caution. And when the financial, global financial crisis broke out 2008-2009, one of the songs from the IMS song sheet, and the African government song sheet, was that Africa was immunized somewhat from the global financial crisis. Why? Because it was inadequately integrated into the global financial markets. Some people said it was a good thing. Now people are saying, you know, it's not such a good thing. You actually have to reintegrate into that. So one of the things that they're calling up for is what you call a secondary bond market. Now that means all the public debt that Panama is concerned about. Investors who want to run out of it have a, can discount quickly rush out of it. The volatility in terms of capital inflow outflow can be utterly destructive. Okay? They can come and go out as predatory as they want. No, you know, and he said, free financial flow, everything like that. So when you have a situation like that, you have secondary bond markets. One of the big things in the Berlin conference last week was uh, domestic debt markets, which all players in the world can come and play. You are asking for big trouble. You're asking for big trouble when 90% of your banking system, which, is, which in Africa is the heart of the financial system as a whole, is foreign owned. In some countries, 100%. Not only foreign owned, but EU in particular. You have a situation where, in terms of African banking, there was a study by the British Financial Press, uh, Financial Times, which said that African banks may be small in terms of global volume, and even in some cases, in terms of even in relation to African GDP. However, next to United States banking system, it is the most profitable when it comes to fees, consultants, all those kind of service, you know, charges that are taking. In other words, even the consultants. You know, in the project preparation and so on, who are going to clean up the money before it even gets to a that's well, it's in the it's in the contracts already, Nancy will confirm that. You have money market managers, not investors, 
running the show now on the basis of the, what they call the 220 principle. 2% 2 is your fee, 20% share of profit if it delivers profit. Now, clearly, you cannot tell me that somebody who buys a public debt in Ethiopia and sells it on in three minutes is an investor of any shop. He's not. He's just a shock, right? Meanwhile, it doesn't stop there. Pensions in Africa are also to be privatized and put in this bag. My sister from Uganda, diaspora bonds and remittances are part of this process. Your own savings and the consumption circuit of you and your family, what they are calling domestic resource mobilization, says that global financial integration will be the one mobilizing those domestic resources for its own purposes. Now, there is no way we can allow this kind of thing to happen. So one of the things I'll tell any government person in Germany tomorrow is that you, you, we want to look at the German, Germany's own experience of development, even if it goes back to the 19th century and its industrialization process. Whatever development banking model was there, why don't we update it and put it on the table today? Why is it that you are subjecting domestic, domestic uh, development banking to a private uh, a, a banking process, through this PPP, through this financial lending, and so on? So there's a lot to be talked about. But I'm saying that even if Reinhardt's scenario is right, and the investments don't come, African governments would have undertaken those regulatory changes already. Massive damage cost, whether the investments come or not. And in fact, the, the prospect that the investment won't come is even worse. Because you cause all that massive collateral damage for nothing. And even if the money comes, a lot more will chase it back up. There's a lot to do, but I am saying that with clear thinking about scaling up the work that we've been doing it together, you know, bringing it together, and so on, whether it is in trade, and we want to move away from exporting flowers, by the way. Okay, absolutely. That's part of our problem, that trade dependency on raw materials. Okay, and, you know, I think that we can hope for better if we pull our heads. And we take the fight to them, starting with whoever is unfortunate from the German government who comes tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Uh, yes, great. Um, thanks, Mr. Malcolm. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm just going to ask you to introduce myself properly. I'm Simon uh, from Economic Justice. Network. We are um, a, a Southern Africa regional organization, but we work in the whole of uh, Africa with our partner networks and organizations. So um, my concern, since we also represent the organized churches, uh, is that in all these uh, measures that are being developed, and some of them are developed by G20 countries, uh, our concern is that the ordinary people are becoming victims of these measures. You get a situation whereby China, they are having their own plan with Africa, India, and also now Germany and G20. But when they try to get their way into our countries, they come through the governments. But those same governments that they come through are the governments that are victimizing their own people. Because when things go wrong, when all these promises that they get uh, from developers or of these uh, programs and initiatives, and people start suffering, they don't have even means to protect their own people. So that's why you get a situation whereby now people feel like uh, to be in Africa is like a curse because the continent is so ravaged by so many challenges, by so many problems. Even the employment opportunities that they promised us that we are gonna get out of these initiatives is not there. And now that creates a situation whereby people are forced to expose their lives into dangerous situations like crossing uh, the Mediterranean uh, to come to Europe. But what we're saying as churches, as organized churches of Africa and also uh, Southern Africa is that we need to know that the lives of people in Africa, it matters as much as the lives of people in all other uh, regions. And uh, we shouldn't be victimized just because uh, you can get it easy with our governments and do things without even consulting the people who will be experiencing the hardship that come because of this thing. So this is just my request to say, even if we talk to the uh, G20 or to Germany or other members of the G20, we need to tell them that 
the lives in Africa matters, and we are not for sale. So I think this is the message that I would like to convey. Thank you very much. I hope, I hope people will join us. And of course. <laughs> um, that's our want to go in. <laughs> no, no. Um, yeah, this, uh, this is... <laughs> you want to add or react or just to develop more the uh, yeah, alternative strategy of uh, having partnerships with Africa? Um, I'd just like to share that um, of the six compact countries, um, we've been reading the IMF agreements with those countries and the World Bank agreements and loans with those countries. For instance, in Tunisia, you know, the World Bank has like broken a record giving like five billion in loans. And, um, you know, in, and the IMF has broken records probably in giving Tunisia $2.9 billion. And there are huge amounts of money flowing in. And I guess I would really, there's so much passion in, in the room, and I would really invite people to read the IMF and World Bank loans and to read the standard contract. Because things like the standard contract, you know, it's, um, it's, it's a bad deal. It's the contract that will be rolled out on the whole continent with, with variations. And it's a bad deal. You can't get a good deal from a bad contract. It just does not work that way. And so until African governments really take a hard look at this, um, and I'm not convinced that they have, and until you know Africans really read the conditionalities on the IMF and the World Bank loans, how many special economic zones to form, how many bankruptcy laws to make, what should the bankruptcy law say, what should the PPP law say. I mean, really, they're very specific about the laws that they want the governments to pass. So I would really recommend, I mean, it's not for me, uh, to say, you know, what African countries should do, but I think that there should be a lot more information and we at the foundation would be glad to be part of providing that so people really know what we're talking about in terms of conditionalities, in terms of requirements, um, and what kind of debt is being, um, is being absorbed by these countries. So I would just make an appeal uh, for everyone to get more information or write me if you want copies of the loans or can't find them. Um, and um, certainly I've watched since the 1980s and the African Alternative Structural Adjustment Program is called AFSAP. You know, I've watched since the 1980s for African countries to fight for policy space. And it, even though I'm not African, you know, I, I'm in a lot of partnerships. And it, you know, since the 1980s, for instance, certain that World Bank has been pushing Africa to privatize lots of its assets. And it makes me kind of sick to see these agreements finally, um, a lot of hope being put on these agreements to finally privatize. Um, assets with the agreement that, you know, users' fees will really be hyped up. And I'm not saying that there aren't good deals in the mix. I'm sure there are good deals in the mix if there are different contract, con contracts created and if people really identify the programs that will meet their, uh, their needs. Uh, but so far, there's not a lot of that occurring. My name is Marcus Hinn. I work for the German NGO Good World Economy, College and Development, and I'm also the co-chair of the Finance Working Group of the C20. First, I want to make a, a general comment on the, on the on the compact, on the nature of the compact, or the two observations. Uh, one is based on some 
stories that an Oxfam collector were based on some also intelligence from, from the ministries, from the German ministry, which was a bit like that. The, the, the history of the compact was, was like this, that Schäuble or the German government said, we want to do something in Africa, and they went to the World Bank, and they said, oh, what can we do? Can you help us? And the World Bank was a bit like, well, what do you want? What do we want? We don't do something specific in Africa, so what, what do you want? And they said, okay, but if you are so pressing us, we just write down something we do anyways, and put it into this compact, and then you can call the compact with Africa. So, so that's a bit supporting maybe uh, Reinhardt's comment that it might be also not such an important initiative, possibly as the, as the most probable outcome, because it's not, not so many new things, and maybe the specific initiative is really not so important. Uh, still, I would say that the content also, and the, the strong PPP focus, and if you look into the compacts, as far as it's on the website, and these prospectus, on the website, it's all with PPP, and they all praise it, and, and they all introduce these frameworks, as far as I perceive it. And, and I find it really the, the most dangerous way of making investments, if, because you don't have the full advantage of a private sector, not the full advantage of a public sector. It's just combining the disadvantages of both public and private investment. That's PPP to me. So at least for a large infrastructure project. So I would really say, uh, even if the compact might be not so important, finally political, it's just a wrong step in this long story of establishing PPP as a main means for investments. So that's why I think we should resist it. And my, my main idea at the moment, which I think would be good to follow, is that you just also look at a specific project that you can use then in a work publicly with our ministries or your ministries. For example, we look currently at a project in Dakar, which is uh, an airport a project, a PPP project uh, from Fraport. Fraport is the, the company that runs the Frankfurt Airport, the biggest airport uh, of Germany, and it's uh, publicly owned, the, the majority still, by the state of Hessen and the city of Frankfurt, and they do all of the world these PPP airports now in that very different ways. And Dakar is one project, and we are still looking into it, but it was uh, the first information we have is a bit like this. They started in 2007 and said it will be ready in 2010-11. And now, we have 2017, it's still not finished, and the current date for opening is December 2017, so a delay of at least six years. Uh, we found out that there have been huge um, delays, even once the, the contract was terminated by, by Matthew Sell in between. Now the reading and negotiate a lot of uh, new claims by Fraport that they want more money, which is a current fee a, a very common feature of PPP contracts. So all the typical problems are there. Um, however, still, for us to find out a lot of information is very difficult, so I think a collaboration on such projects would be very helpful. Another example, we're looking into German companies engaged in special economic zones, just to expose that this German company has a 10, 20 year tax break or unfinished tax break or so, which I believe is in the German public still something you could work with, because it's still something to say, Siemens has a 10 year tax break, doesn't, doesn't pay any tax at all. If you say that's a development project, that's just uh, insane. And I think if you would have very specific examples that, that are also some more proven, pro, pro, waterproof, then you can say they are active there, they have the tax break, we could use this in Germany to do some work, and then at least maybe if, if the contact goes on, to have better projects than without this public criticism. Which because then they are forced to say, oh, oh, no, 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 that was not what we wanted. We wanted, of course, to pay tax and all this. And I know that companies are highly under pressure now because the, the reputation risk, as they call it, is higher than five years ago, the tax is something that the investors look at, that the public looks at, politics looks at. So they, they have a really growing fear, what we also hear from companies and from the German Industry Association. It was told at the compact opening conference last week, there was a representative from the German Industry Association, and she said, yeah, it's a fact, it's a growing reputational risk if you do not pay tax. And I think you should use this and be really expose the problem with the special economic zones, which are also quite prominent, I think, in the compact. So these are some elements, and the last comment on, on Jeche. Uh, I really would like you to ask tomorrow Mr. Farbeck, the, the guy from my finance ministry, which is uh, with you on the panel tomorrow, what, what was the way Germany developed. Because if you ask him, then he should actually say, oh, at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, we had a lot of founding of uh, cooperative banks and public savings banks. And until today, this is the backbone of the German financing of the small, middle-sized companies, which was also much more, not completely, but much more, safe in the crisis, and so this is actually what you should do. 
and not uh, maybe a domestic bond market, even though I, I bit disagree that I think it's better to have domestic debt at least uh, than, than international, which I think you also say, but I think it's let's, much better. Let's than, keep the debate going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, but I think you should really ask Mr. Fadek, uh, what is the main financier of the German um, of the German uh, business? And then he must say it's the Sparkassen, the, the savings banks, and the Genossenschaftsbank, the, the cooperative banks. And that's actually what you should also, I think, follow, unless you make a completely different system also. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marcus. I think um, the last thing that I would like to say here is that we should come out of this uh, beauty contest and get into something else. And I want to go in line as the, the, the kind of uh, we, we need to turn the conspiracy into a good game. Nancy said there's no way for a good deal. But there is. There, there is. And I think that's what we should be working on. That is, if... Nancy said there was no way for a good deal if we have a bad contract. Good. Then we're going to work on those contracts. Right. They call it, they call it standard construct. And uh, first, the first thing that we will have to do is to get them out of the concept of standard. It can't be standard. If you are dealing with different countries, if you are dealing with a continent where you have specificities, then you can't go on the basis of a standard contract. You may have a standard framework. Even the framework would be, uh, it would not be good to have something standard. So first thing we should get out of that and make sure that we have enough flexibility for each compact country. Let us be the compact because the compact, it is here to stay. If you reject it, it will come back with another name. Because this is the structural adjustment coming back with that name. So we take it and then we try to turn it into something else. That is, we use the conspiracy to get a good deal for Africa. And I think that's what we should be working on. Tamo uh, said something about the African monetary fund. Why not? And we shouldn't wait for other people to come and do that for us. We need to continue the work that we started and stopped somewhere about the Afghan monetary fund. I remember Oscar this morning made a presentation. He didn't name it, but he was referring to that. You need to be able, where you are, to regulate enough for people who come to invest to be working on a path that you've indicated. People shouldn't come and create the path for you. And I think that's what we should be working on. There are, I think the civil society has a role to play here. And if we play it well, we will make things difficult for those who want to talk conspire against us. Thank you. Um, I hope it's not the last word. <laughs> I hope uh, there are some other people, maybe Mr. Tano again, uh, to join us here. Um, also to speak out for a specific network or a specific country or whatsoever. And or about the political agenda uh, of Germany, maybe. And Mr. Tano wants to hear something. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, I'm. Um, I take Marcus's uh, uh, point about uh, domestic debt being better than the foreign debt, but I think that what is uh, the specific thing here is the context within which the domestic debt market is being introduced, and who are those who are going to be part of that debt market? Because if you have, you know, anybody from anywhere buying and shorting your domestic debt, I mean, it could create all kinds of problems. So it's not the institution as such; it is the purpose that it is being enacted to serve, and being one of the spearheads of a deeper financial deregulation and liberalization. It's in that context that this is being proposed at this time in this way. And I think we ought to uh, pay attention to that. Otherwise, all manner of different institutions can be suited to different purposes, which points to the fact that Martin's point is particularly important. One of the things about the, the, the whole infrastructure thing is that it's predicated on a myth anyway. No one knows for sure that we really need 50 or 100 billion infrastructure gap. No one knows for that. That is just speculation. Because if you are going to be serious about infrastructure, you ought to be able to say, what is the kind of infrastructure that, let's say, farmers, small-scale farmers need? If they want, for example, 
a, a, a kind of sustainable new machine tool industry which will prevent child labor, which will, you know, so on and so forth. What are the kinds of infrastructure, including financial infrastructure, which they need? Warehousing, so on and so forth. What kind of local materials? That is how you talk about it. Yeah. Sure, there's some big things which are the threshold of all modern citizenship, water, electricity, sustainable energy, so on and so forth. But the fact does remain that if you unbundle that and it is based on proper planning, democratic participation, democratic decision making, you will actually come up with a reasonably sound infrastructure project. projects and plan, which is, is the part. So there's many things that can be done. And I think, again, I take Martin's original point, which is to say that this is an opportunity to open a conversation. And not simply open a conversation, but steer it in a, a certain di direction and harvest some positives from which, you know, positive building blocks at the, at the very minimum uh, uh, from. Because, again, I think that some of the things that my colleagues said is, are really serious. Like, those about investor protection, they go beyond anything we've ever seen anywhere. For example, in the framework document, it doesn't even simply talk about investor protection. It proposes that African governments set up institutions which will proactively when they sense or suspect or hope or fear that some investor will complain about something many years down the line, they ought to take proactive remedies to that. It's like saying, you know, my, my, this, I don't even know what, what, what analogy to use, but it is the most absurd idea that you can come up with. And absurdity is in the context of the fact that we have to understand that Africa is also a laboratory for all manner of different things. What I said about the new generation of pensions privatizations, the fact does remain that part of, I saw in one part of one German ministry document, I forget which one, which was suggesting also that some of the new, you know, uh, the, the, ways, the ways in which risk averse pensions can be unchanged, those laws could also be applied to them. In other words, if you get new types of, you know, liberalization uh, and benchmarks in Africa, nothing prevents the global TNCs, the big power players, to start multilateralizing or internationalizing those new standards. And you too, it will come back and bite you in the sorry in delicate places. So basically, <coughs> so, so, basically, so basically, I think that the things that we are opposed to, I think we ought to be categorical about, politely, based on fact, watertight evidence, strong argumentation, both based on history and context, where the global economy is going, and so on. And I want to end on that point. I think that this thing also represents an ambition. It may not be realized. But the, it, I do detect or sense a hint of an ambition by the German government to make a big push in Africa. And there's a history to it. In 2007, at the height of the uh, negotiations for the uh, African version of the TTIP, the Economic Partnership Agreement, the German government launched what it called the Raw Material Initiative, which was to say it was being squeezed out of access to strategic raw materials in different parts of the world by China on the one hand and the United States on the other. And that it wanted. It, it, and part of that, for example, the Conrad Adenauer Foundation sponsored many, many conferences, produced all kinds of papers about the necessity of make, having a strategic foothold in terms of African raw materials for German businesses. Through that, for example, certain new and unfounded demands were made in the EPA negotiations, including, for example, export taxes, which was you know, on all kinds of uh, things and so on. So there is that. In recent times, the migration problem might have presented the German government with a perfect excuse. Okay, I read a paper by a guy called Thomas Zaboski or something like that. I saw someone holding another paper with the same uh, author's name. I, I don't know if it's the same paper or not. She wasn't German, which might as well be Greek to me. But, <clears throat> but, uh, but the, 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 the point about it is that it, what he managed to show is the close correlation, especially in Africa, and tied to development interventions between the German military and its processes and its interventions. And different type of things. If you notice, final point, sorry. If you notice that both China and the United States have been fairly distant from this G20 compact, they have their own mechanisms. They are not the ones shouting. In fact, even Japan took advantage in Berlin to get, get a little dig on, uh, to, to China about, you know, uh, it, it will be quality infrastructure, <laughs> which we all know who he was referring to. So, okay. But Germany is a surplus country. In the current global economy, the situation that we're in, China is the other surplus country. There is no way that in the era of Trump and all his ridiculousness, dangerous ridiculousness, or only effective ridiculousness, that 
the idea and Michael's point about the fact that we Europeans want to take care of ourselves and so on and so forth. I mean, you know, we are not blind. One, and, and we're not saying that these people are high and mighty and they can see into the future and they plan everything down to a T. No, that's not what we're saying. But what we're saying is that they, are, they have a system which is coherent up to a point and that when it senses an opportunity and the timing is right, there's a point. So this may be experimental, it may end in nothing like you were saying, like right after saying, on the other hand, who knows? You know, Merkel isn't simply negotiating migration deals in Africa. She's also beginning to build infrastructure. The African Union complex, funded by the Chinese. Just last year, the Germans have started building all kinds of prestige projects in Africa as well. Okay, and it is possible, distinctly possible, at least we, we will be irresponsible if we are not alert to the possibility that there is this push going on of the possibility of a push emerging and then we can discuss all that, what all that means. And therefore, the idea that there is a scramble, a new scramble, scramble dynamics for African resources is possible. That's one of the reasons why. You may have compact, individual compact countries instead of the regions, although I wouldn't put too much faith in the regions, like saying that if Mr. Schreibler and co are dangerous in Germany, once they gather in Europe, they are somehow transformed into better people, ask the people of Greece. So, so basically, the thing is that, I think that the, 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 the way in which we understand, the, 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 and someone I think was you, made the point about integrating our efforts, the way in which we understand the conjuncture between migration, between all these various concerns, and the possibility of making profits out of that, promoting business, using the soft power of development aid, coming to with these con uh, 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 compacts and so on. So those possibilities exist, and I think that it will be responsible and the right thing to do to be paying attention to these dynamics, in addition to the specifics that, some of the specifics that we've mentioned. Okay. Incidentally, the compact also demands the conclusion of the EPA, not just as it is now, but a new generation, which will include the non-goods part, telecoms, serv financial services, intellectual property, the compact demands that. It demands that the EPA be, be also the threshold for any common agreement that African countries may reach among themselves. Please, there is a lot to be said about what is underfoot, and let's see that, uh, let, let, let's uh, pay more attention, thank you. And uh, of course there will be uh, more time tomorrow, also in the consultation day. Um, I just have another last question for all of you, um, for example, the discussion has been also more about the uh, big structures, the macroeconomic things and so on. Um, I would ask you if you have an advice for, for example, small diaspora businesses from Germany here in Hamburg who wants to uh, invest in their own countries. Uh, if you are a businessman for a small or medium sized company here in Germany, what, are, what is your advice to them, what they try to, what they should do, um, and what they should try to push through the political agenda here in Germany also? They should pay universal minimum income to start with. Yes, and other things? Well, a lot of decisions have already been made. Looking, I'm looking at the compact with um, Tunisia right now. It calls for like nine international airports, 12 competitive competition clusters, seven commercial seaports, um, you know, um, highway, highway, cyber parks. And, and so some of these are so big that they could likely only work as subcontractors to these. Um, and the key question I think, I think you're asking, I would ask a different question, and I would ask the question of how we bring small and medium-sized enterprises in Africa into the compact, because I think that the opportunities for uh, procurement from foreign uh, enterprises will be really ample. Um, but domestic African businesses, I think it's very, the question is very important. Uh, thank you, Nancy, for changing the question into that one. <laughs> because, yes, it's one of the six points that African citizens hear. Because we are saying that we want private sector to come and invest in Africa. Okay, good. Let us admit that it's a good thing and we are accepting that. 
that I don't even know how we will be to review this thing. When they come in, there should be a mechanism for a domestic private sector to evolve. Because we know that in Africa we have we have like 90% of the economy based on what some call it the informal. Those are entrepreneurs where they are, who do a lot, but who do not have access to financing, for instance, to, 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 to real capital that they need. One single dollar that you put as investment with those people, those entrepreneurs, would bring back more than $30. That's from a study. So we need to go there and, and groom a private sector, which is made up of small and medium-sized enterprises, domestic. Mm -hmm. That will then be in that festival and also make profit. And that profit, Fanwell, will go nowhere but stay in Africa. So there should be a mechanism for that. And this is where the diaspora would come in here. That is, they, they could put pressure on Germany to create a space for medium-sized enterprises coming from this side to be part of those big projects. I think that's another opportunity. And if we combine those two, the opportunity for small business to be part of the compact coming from Germany and the other G20 countries, and the grooming of a domestic private sector in Africa, then that could be the small part of it where we make benefit for African citizens. <laughs> okay, you wanted to add something also, Marcos? Um, yeah, of course, if you can uh, come with that. Just a short comment on, on DHA. I agree that some of the compact might be some experimental stuff uh, tested, tested in Africa. However, the, the I mean, it's clear that OSPPP is a strong policy in Europe, also in Germany, just for you to know also. Like highways, there are PPP highways. But it's also important to know there's a strong criticism even within the German system. For example, the German PPP highways have been regularly evaluated by the German Court of Auditors. And they were all negative that this is a, a project which is a, a good project in terms of uh, that it's cheaper by PPP compared to the public procurement directly. And so there is also strong material which might be also of use for you if you have ever encountered your government and say, oh, they, they do this, the G20 countries, because they have so much successes or so. There's a lot of material out there on negative effects in, in uh, G20 and Europe countries, or for example, Spain last year, the whole system of, of highway PPP project uh, leaders broke down. They were all uh, bankrupt and all this. So there's a lot of stuff you might also use if you have any discussion. And um, last point also, which is not really a kind of experiment in Africa, is the fact that the pension funds are liberalized to invest more into real estate. That's an, thing which goes on for years now, the debate in the European Union, uh, the Capital Market Union in Germany, there has been a commission three years ago which evaluated um, means how to bring more pension fund money into German infrastructure. Also. So it's not only somehow going to Africa, it's, it's everywhere. So it's a global capitalist, um, capitalist um, I don't know, mode at the moment that they try to push for this. Would you have an advice also? Just in a minute, uh, would you have an advice also to improve the uh, yeah, small and medium-sized business sector in African countries? That's what I said before. I okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you all. Uh, I'm from Togo, a French country. So if I speak English, you don't do it. Don't be. Uh, if I hear my. African, I saw that, uh, or I see that uh, a Marshall Plan for Africa is a good thing. It's not bad. But the conception, they were not integrated. It's not good. Uh, you must integrate them for uh, some reforms or some. Uh, changing of uh, ideas and uh, I will propose that you and big uh, government members also because this thing, this new partnership is good 
but it will not create another problem in the country. So, uh, for example, if uh, I think about uh, the guarantee of PPP, I'm asking problem. If this guarantee is uh, public, does uh, civil society can benefit this PPP? What guarantee the civil society can have to, to the contract? And we are the, uh, the population uh, adv adversary. We have to, to explain the, 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 the foundation of this part, uh, new partnership. Uh, but if we explain, but we can't act, you see? So there are many, many, many uh, things I think that uh, uh, shall be correct to allow society and uh, civil society involvement in this partnership uh, uh, promotion, you see? Uh, we know that uh, in Africa now uh, there is a center, a sweet level development center uh, for Africa, which is created in Kigali. And uh, in this center, uh, there is a seven head of states uh, who will. Uh, govern the center. What uh, will the place of the civil society in this center? Uh, this also must be a, a, well, must be a, I don't know how will be the method. I don't know if uh, the Marshall Plan we recommend to this uh, center uh, civil society representative here at this uh, summit. I don't know. But uh, there must be a correlation, a good correlation, uh, everything to have a good mechanism for the well being of uh, uh, African population. You see, uh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was a quite good work at the end of our uh, discussion. And I um, really thank you, all of you, of course, and um, also Mr. Tonkiu and Mrs. Alexander and Mr. Bukosi. And thank you very much for attending the workshop. And hopeful, I'm hopeful that there is a good uh, conversation also tomorrow with the uh, federal uh, finance minister uh, consultant there or somehow and yes it's going on to be uh, or to working for Africa and I hope we all do.